Last month, uh, former White House uh, Coronavirus Response Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks said, and I'm going to quote Dr. Burks here, quote, there were about 100,000 deaths that came from the original surge. All of the rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased substantially, end of quote. Uh, that's certainly a pretty damning assessment in the wake of over a, a half a million deaths in the United States and increasing cases uh, in Michigan right now and in states uh, across uh, the country. So my qu first question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Lori, uh, is that well, I'm not going to ask you to put any kind of number uh, on it, but and generally, would you agree with Dr. Burke's assessment? Oh, absolutely, I would agree. And I think there have been a number of, you know, modeling exercises that have suggested that 40 plus percent of the deaths um, were avoidable. I want to remind us that it's not only the deaths, but it's people who have suffered long term health consequences from COVID. It's people who have suffered long term mental health consequences from COVID. It's their families uh, and obviously the consequences with the social and economic disruption. And I'd also just say, going forward, there's still a lot of opportunity to avoid death, not only with vaccination, but as you and Dr. Gerberding point out, uh, by taking seriously now the surge we're seeing in cases and having people take the appropriate public health measures. We're still all in this. Uh, absolutely, we def definitely are. Do Dr. Gerberding, uh, would, would you agree uh, with Dr. Lori and uh, Dr. Burks, again, without giving any numbers, but the general assessment of their statements? Well, of course, I don't have the actual data or the modeling raw material, but I think it's common sense that if we'd been able to identify cases and isolate them and their contacts sooner, we would have seen a much slower startup to this problem and we would have bought a lot more time than we were left to deal with once we recognized how widespread it had already become. So that clearly is a major issue. The reasons for it are complex. I've tried to understand them from the outside looking in. But I think, um, as I mentioned in my written testimony, there are some things we can do now to harden ourselves against a, a future that brings that particular problem to the bear again on, on the inability to respond initially. Um, I will also say that um, this is a, a shared responsibility. CDC certainly um, made its share of missteps at the beginning. We also needed some regulatory support for expanding access to tests when they became available and then a faster mechanism to bring the private sector that can really scale testing into the situation. So the solution is broad, but nevertheless, it was a very early and unfortunate um, problem. Well, no, no question about that. And, and I want to focus now uh, uh, with you, uh, Dr. Gerberding, uh, on the three-week period in, in late February to early March 2020, at the very beginning of uh, what we saw with this pandemic. The number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. increased by more than 1,000-fold, uh, according to the CDC, a critical period, uh, clearly, at the beginning of this pandemic. My question to you is, in your view, uh, what factors led to that rapid rise in COVID-19 cases? And you've alluded to many of the different types of stuff, but if you could just focus in on that initial stage, which was just so critical, what steps could the federal government have taken to mitigate that spread right at the very outset during that three-week period, late February, early March? Yeah, I, I think it's tough. Um, what we now know in retrospect, that this is one of the most transmissible viruses we've ever had to deal with from a respiratory perspective. The fact that we have uh, had ongoing coronavirus transmission, but essentially no flu transmission tells you what the differential is in terms of their probability of spread. So it was a really tough challenge. And it was made a lot tougher by not being able to get in there early and really not just look at people with a travel history or those that we suspected were at high risk, but to understand very early in the course of things that asymptomatic transmission was happening at a rate, uh, again, somewhat unprecedented in disease transmission. And we also, I think, really uh, would have been much more assertive about doing sampling studies, population level sampling studies, where we really look for the hot spots based on what we know about previous settings where viruses are easily transmitted by the respiratory route and, and accelerated the science of, of the transmission 
coefficients so that we would be able to better predict where to go to look for cases, even when testing wasn't widely available. So uh, in a sense, this was a failure of imagination, a failure to appreciate that this wasn't going to be like SARS or MERS where the efficiency of transmission from person to person was low. This was a disease that was spread like wildfire and we responded as if it were sort of business as usual. Uh, Dr. Laurie, I want to uh, ask you a question related to those very initial stages uh, as well, where we saw this uh, acceleration of the, the spread of, of the virus. In your testimony, uh, you identify multiple missteps uh, in that initial uh, response, uh, and you specifically highlight, I want to quote uh, what you specifically highlight. You, you say, quote, all the authorities in the world cannot make up for the failure of leadership, end of quote. My question is you is what avoidable harm in your view uh, flowed most directly from this failure of leadership as the initial pandemic response unfolded in January, February and March uh, of last year? I think the avoidable harm um, started with the ability to, of the virus to spread like wildfire because we didn't acknowledge that it was going on uh, and we didn't take the steps to contain it either the public health kinds of measures that Dr. Gerberding talked about, uh, the steps to ramp up things like the production of masks and PPE to protect healthcare workers and to protect the supply chain uh, and others, and everything that's unfolded from there. If you think that the first uh, 100,000 cases were maybe um, unavoidable or less, certainly we could have changed the trajectory of this and and save countless lives. So the failure to take all of the early actions, those that I mentioned and more, uh, were were really all avoidable and would have been much more avoidable had there been uh, open and public acknowledgement of these risks. Even if we didn't know how bad it was, it was our responsibility to prepare for the worst uh, and to alert the public. Uh, the other really, um, avoidable harm has been the politicization of this. And so the public has gotten really confused about who to believe, what to believe. And obviously people are still at odds with each other over enough on a lot of aspects of this. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator Ossoff. Uh, uh, we, uh, we may have an, another Senator or two. We're about ready to start uh, votes and folks, we have multiple committees, so we may have uh, another Senator or two arrive. So in the meantime, uh, I'm going to take the liberty as chair to ask another couple of questions uh, uh, while while we wait. So my, my uh, first uh, question, this is going to, I'm going to put it out to, to the panel uh, to give me a sense. Uh, you know, one thing that, that's clear as we've gone through this incredibly difficult time uh, is that there are many conflicting authorities, and we've talked about that throughout uh, this hearing. So uh, although it's clear there are conflicting authorities, there's no clear path as to who should actually be uh, in, in charge. And you think about the multiple laws right now that we have on the books that determine disaster and public health emergency response authorities. We have Public Health Services Act, the Stafford Act, the National Emergencies Act, various Homeland Security presidential directives, presidential policy directives, and that list unfortunately can just go on. And so this, I'll, I'll ask this to you first, uh, Dr. Laurie, but I'd certainly love to have the input of, of, of all of you. And Dr. Laurie, I, I ask it first because you already testified about the need for a clear federal agency to, to lead in pandemic response. Uh, yet from uh, this initial COVID-19 response, there was continued confusion. There were changes in authorities as we went along. So uh, it's a very direct question. Who at the federal level should have led the response in your mind uh, for this public health crisis? I would love to hear from the, uh, the other panelists as well. Sure. I think the White House should have designated uh, a lead at NSC uh, supported by FEMA to lead this and fold together a whole of government response as they have for so many other crises. As Mr. Nimich testified uh, and Ms. Zimmerman testified, uh, FEMA can help coordinate and support. You know, at the beginning, you don't even know how bad it's going to be, and it evolves over time. And so what may be that the lead in coordination needs to evolve over time, but there's no reason not to mobilize a whole of government response and there are many mechanisms to do that. You just have to choose for them. Great. Anyone else? Just jump in, please. 
Uh, I'll just say, I think the whole of government is the concept, although it's more than government, as we've seen, yeah. the private sector is critically important and the whole health system matters in a situation like this. But the concept of planning for the whole of government, the strategic framework for the operation being something that really has to be done by the administration because all the cabinets are involved and then executing the components of that plan in the agency that's best suited to carry out the specific tasks or objectives at hand. So it's kind of plan horizontally, execute vertically, and then maintain that coordinating function. From an operational and logistical perspective, I think the FEMA conversation can also come into play here, especially when there are issues about deployment of material goods or um, getting things moved around from one place to, to another. So there are many different dimensions of the operation, but the strategic framework, the intent of the response really needs to be centralized, in my opinion, in the White House. Right. Chairman, I, I, I have to respond that the national response framework gives you the ability to do this. And uh, as Dr. Laurie will <clears throat> attest, FEMA supported HHS in Flint, Michigan. We supported HHS in the in the um, Ebola outbreak. We supported HHS in the Zika outbreak. The ability to use the infrastructure and the response training and professionalism inside FEMA doesn't have to be in charge, but you have to make that clear. And I do think there was a stumble when we said HHS was not in charge and now FEMA is in charge. It should have been HHS is in charge and FEMA is the supporting entity that is implementing HHS's knowledge base of the pandemic. I would agree. Great, great. Ms. Zimmerman? Yes, and, and I agree with what uh, Mr. Nimick has just said. Um, this is something FEMA does. They do it for all disasters all the time. The, the system that's in place within the NRF and within the National Response Coordination Center, all the federal agencies, voluntary agencies, even the private sector is very familiar with how that works. Um, and to be able to employ that very quickly during disasters is key. And it doesn't matter how big or small, um, it's practiced all the time, state level, states have set up their emergency operations centers much the same way. So it's really something that gives people that opportunity to, to jump right into events. And I think doing that, but I think being led by the agency that has the, the known mission set, um, such as any pandemic and that, with the HHS being the lead for that. Um, and then how, you know, in this event, they established the Unified Coordination Group, which was the first time ever for at a national, at the federal level to establish that, I think was key. And I think to, just to keep that in the forefront is very important going forward. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could have a, a, another opportunity, I do think that the challenge is deciding if you're going to activate the National Response Coordination Center at FEMA. And I think that there should be a much more robust interface of all of the departments, particularly ASPR and FEMA on a day-to-day -day basis. It shouldn't be when we make a decision that we have crossed the threshold that we now activate the NRCC. There needs to be, each of the emergency support functions need a day-to-day -day connectivity in the environment we're in because things happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Mr. Nimich, I'm gonna ask you a, a question. Um, uh, in your testimony, uh, you discussed the need to create additional surge capacity for supplies in an emergency, and you, you recommend that this responsibility be given to a new FEMA surge uh, center. So my question to, to you is, uh, what additional authorities uh, and funding, if any, uh, do you believe that this uh, center uh, would need if we were to set it up? So I think, Chairman, this goes back to the ability to access all those um, silos of data Dr. Lori talked about. And it's not just in the medical side, but it is in the supply side and the demand side of these. We, we um, often protect our data or don't wanna trust our data. So that surge center would create an environment where we can have data that is protected, not utilized in a way that the provider of that data wouldn't want it. So the public sector can bring in and tell me there is excess 
capacity of PPE at this location and know that that is being trusted and will only be used when there's a need nationally or we can inform another state or another county that that, in, that capacity exists somewhere and they can access it. But that doesn't exist. It will require additional authorities to allow FEMA to uh, integrate that data. It can be done with uh, medical data as well as Dr. Laurie pointed out, or, and it will require improvement in technology. Uh, the technology exists today, whether it's um, in uh, how we, we protect our information, but also access our information. We have the technology now to be able to access all of that. The artificial intelligence will start us to be able to be smarter of where we put our human capability. But it's really a, a center where you can bring that data in on a day-to-day -day basis and add to it. I, wanna, I, I, I was not monitoring how much of the precursor uh, elements were needed for our pharmaceuticals. Now I want to access that information and understand where those precursor chemicals come from. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to be uh, wrapping up this hearing. This has uh, been uh, fascinating, but I, I do have one last uh, question for, for Dr. Laurie, and then we will uh, wrap this up. Dr. Laurie, in your, in your testimony, you discussed the need to, to gain additional visibility into the medical supply chain, and you noted in that uh, testimony that during the uh, H1N1 and Ebola epidemic, HHS put together a system to gain visibility in the supply chain, which is uh, critical. As part of our federal preparedness, as we're looking forward, uh, should the U.S. government establish as part of its infrastructure a permanent system to track medical supply chain? And as you're thinking that through and uh, with an answer, uh, what limitations currently res restrict ASPR's visibility into the supply chain that we need to be aware of? Terrific question. And I think, obviously, as we've talked about at this hearing, uh, we've talked about precursor material, we've talked about API, we've talked about all kinds of supplies. Um, and yes, um, we absolutely do need uh, to have visibility into all of the critical elements of the medical and healthcare supply chain. This goes from essential medications all the way, as I think in my written testimony, I talked about the pipette tips and the little laboratory uh, wells that are important for running the diagnostic tests. The strategic national stockpile has traditionally only had visibility on what's there. Um, and yet we know that there is a lot more in the supply chain. We know we have critical drug shortages every year and we don't do a good job monitoring those either. So yes, I think uh, either a system that uh, Mr. Nimich outlined or the strategic national stockpile needs to build the capability to have that visibility and monitor critical health and medical supplies. Uh, when we did it in H1N1 and uh, Ebola, we did it using the threat of the Defense Production Act to ask um, manufacturers and suppliers to share the information and we're able to keep it confidential so we didn't disrupt their businesses. But I, this is an area where I do think new authorities uh, and funding will be really, really important uh, to set up the system so that you know what you need and can track that day to day and that you have enhanced ability to track uh, and if needed voluntarily or compulsorily redistribute in an emergency situation. It's going to be a big lift and a big build, but the whole private sector of our economy does this very successfully every day, uh, day in and day out. And there is a lot of expertise and tools to use out there to build such a system that's critical. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you. And, and it's clear from your statement, you do believe there are additional authorities that are necessary. So legislative action uh, will be necessary? Yes. yes. Well, very good. Well, we'll uh, look forward to talking further uh, with you uh, on that. We're in the process of drafting some of that. So we'll look forward to working with the, the details. And again, I wanna thank each of our uh, witnesses today. Uh, this is just a, a great hearing. Uh, we've got an awful lot of information. Uh, clearly there's a whole lot more information to gather in the, in the months uh, ahead as we continue to, to look uh, at what happened and uh, think through uh, how we can do it uh, to better. As I mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, we always wanna celebrate our successes.
uh, we should do that, but we also need to find out where the failures were and make sure that we're plugging uh, those those gaps. And that's the, the intent of uh, what we want to do in this hearing. So with that, uh, the hearing record will remain open uh, for 15 days until April 29th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions uh, for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.